Hello, and welcome to module three of this online workshop on free speech in K-12 schools. This is part three in a five-part series of online modules. This module will focus on how to understand and address First Amendment issues that seem to be in competition with one another, specifically religion and expression. The session's focus will be on what they call balancing what are referred to as competing rights, particularly when issues of religious freedom seem to go against other principles of expression in schools. To start, we'll focus on a particular legal test called the Lemon Test for Constitutionality that is used to help better understand and resolve such conflicts. The Lemon Test arose out of a 1971 case in Pennsylvania where the state was using government funds to pay teachers of non-religious content working at private religious, mostly Catholic schools. In this case, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that Pennsylvania's 1968 Non-Public Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which had allowed the state superintendent to reimburse non-public schools, most of which were Catholic, for the salaries of teachers who taught secular material using secular textbooks, that this still violated the Establishment Clause. The decision was also upheld. Um, an earlier case happened in the First Circuit, which struck down a Rhode Island Salary Supplement Act, which was a similar situation. So this case established a three-pronged test to determine if religion was being overly favored in decisions made by government agencies. These three prongs state that one, the government's action must have a secular legislative purpose. Two, the government's action must not have the primary effect of either advancing or inhibiting religion. And three, the government's action must not result in an excessive government entanglement with religion. If any of these three prongs are violated, the government's action is deemed unconstitutional under the Establishment Clause that was mentioned in the introductory module for this workshop. One example of how these competing rights play out are exemplified in the case of a Native student, Adriella Roca, of the Lipan Apache Nation living in Texas, whose long hair violated his local school district's dress codes, which stipulated that boys' hair must not go past their collar. In this case, the parents contacted the school the summer before their son started kindergarten to request a relig relig religious exemption from the dress code since his long hair was an important part of their spiritual tradition. This exemption was not granted and he was placed in in-school suspension when he arrived for kindergarten because his hair was too long. The parents filed a First Amendment complaint against the school district and the superintendent was clearly not willing to recognize the family's position. He stated, quote, it's no secret what our policy is. You'll cut your hair to the right point. You'll tuck in your shirt. You'll have a belt. There's a lot of school districts that have lost their discipline and all their beliefs. Needville's pretty tight about that. They're pretty tight about the traditions they have. If they want to say it's a freedom of religion issue, what religion are you? And his argument that he was making here was that because there was no formal religious text that um, they could point to, um, that they, their spiritual tradition should not be given the same protection that other um, more traditional Western established traditions um, would be granted. Another point that is not specifically relevant to the legal decision, but important to note, is that there are gendered and racialized notions happening in this case that are worth paying attention to. That this dress code about hair length and the fact that it only applies to male students um, and the fact that they have this school district has other extensive dress code limitations on seeing things such as sideburns and cornrows and other kinds of hair um, displays, that this notion that men must have short hair doesn't allow for other religious and cultural groups who value and expect men to grow their hair long um, in other religions like Sikh, the Sikh tradition, Orthodox Jew, Native Americans. There's many other forms of... Um, manhood where long hair is definitely part of that identity. So this case, a uh, federal judge ruled that the school district did violate the constitutional rights of the student for not letting him wear his hair according to his Native American religious beliefs. And the school district chose to appeal and the student and his family won the appeal as well. The important point was made by a legal director of the ACLU of Texas by the name of Lisa Graybill. She pointed out that some families don't have the stamina the Arogas had to really follow through with this. 
I know a couple kids that went ahead and cut their hair because the families decided that their children couldn't afford to be out of class for as long as it would take to get resolution. So it's important to recognize that when there are conflicts like this, that the schools and the children and their families are having to make decisions about how long can we afford to pursue this fight and um, at what cost. So the next case is a situation where we had a conservative religious group that was taking issue with a school district's court-ordered efforts to address problems they had been experiencing related to anti-LGBTQ harassment at their school. This case took place in Kentucky, where a federal judge had ordered the Boyd County Public Schools to implement an anti-harassment training and updated policy as part of the settlement in a lawsuit that the ACLU had brought on behalf of students who had wanted to form a gay-straight alliance club at Boyd County High School. The school district agreed to implement the training in 2005 after a judge found that there was a widespread problem with anti-gay harassment in the school. And there was even an example of students in the English class once stated that they needed to take all of the expletive anti-gay slur out in the backwoods and kill them. So the school was trying to implement this new anti-harassment training and then a national conservative religious legal advocacy organization known as the Alliance Defense Fund, which is based in Arizona, gathered a few parents together to file a complaint against the school district. They tried to argue that this school-wide training violated the religious beliefs of Christian families and that the school's anti-harassment policy was unconstitutional. However, the district court in this case decided that these trainings were developed by the school under court order and were considered, quote, government speech. That is, they reflect the pedagogical mission of the school and are consistent with its curricular objectives. As a result, these trainings do not need to be viewpoint neutral and they can present the information that best supports the school's purpose. As a result, they did not allow any religious exemption from participating in such trainings. The next case also shows a conflict that arose between religious conservative families and schools trying to uh, include instruction around LGBT topics. It had a different outcome because in this case, the speaker who was presenting the religious message was a student. So it was happening at a school-sponsored panel on religion and homosexuality during a diversity week event at a school in Michigan. A student on the panel had her speech edited by school officials to remove comments stating that homosexuality was sinful. Since this was student speech and not official school curriculum or government speech, the court found that there was no legitimate pedagogical concern in censoring the student's speech and the school had violated her speech rights. So one of the big differences in these cases is who is speaking? Is it an official representative of the school? or is it a student? If it is a student, then we do need to go back to the principles presented in module one on student speech rights. Does the speech cause a substantial disruption? Is it lewd or obscene? Does it include pro-drug messages or fighting words? If these aren't present, then the student may be allowed to speak at school-sponsored events, even if the viewpoint is not consistent with the pedagogical mission of the school. However, schools often have policies about non-discrimination or bullying and harassment that might also be relevant in these cases because such speech might fall under those categories as well. So now that we have presented these four different cases, the paying teacher salaries in Catholic schools, the religious exemptions from dress codes, as well as the government speech or school-sponsored speech on LGBT topics, I invite you to pause the video and choose a few items from the list presented to discuss if you think these pass the three prongs of the lemon test or not. Be sure to pay attention to whether each form of speech would be considered government speech or school-sponsored speech. Also think about, have these issues come up at your school? If so, how were they handled? Do you agree with how they were handled? Pause the video and take a few minutes to review these items and discuss with a partner or jot down some ideas before continuing. 
Welcome back. So you've had a chance to reflect on some of these various controversies and I want to present you with some guiding principles that I've elicited from various resources um, meant to help teachers navigate these difficult topics in their classrooms. So for example, schools can sponsor the study of religion but not the practice of religion. We are expected to expose students to many views and we may not impose a single view or even endorse or elevate a single view, religious viewpoint. We can focus on issues related to instruction of all kinds of knowledge, but not indoctrination. You can study what all people believe, but you can't teach students what to believe. And most importantly, student safety including paying attention to non-discrimination and ha harassment policies should always be a top priority. Now there's some very helpful information on the website presented by the National Coalition Against Censorship, which provides some additional guidelines and detailed information about additional um, legal decisions if you have uh, greater in continued interest in this topic. This is the end of module three on competing rights. The next module is module four and will take up how these issues of religion and expression are taken up in science classrooms in particular, particularly in cases of teaching evolution.